Alright, time for another DriftPhysics.com, DebatePhysics.com, but can't find any debaters. Somebody to get into a counterpoint, point, counterpoint kind of discussion about these elemental functions of physical reality. And the fact that the, whatever, the physicist, <laughs> the, the cabal of um, educated um, scientists, quote unquote, uh, claim to be the truth and they really haven't looked into any of it. They just, you know, they just spout what they've been told. They just mimic the rhetoric of the past and uh, never really think about what they're actually, the implications of what they're saying. So simple things like you find out that the the physical implication of their stated law of reality is that it takes 25 times the fuel to spin a motor five times as fast or that something spinning five times as fast has 25 times the capacity to do work and uh, yeah, no no it's just, it's just nonsense they have zero evidence that that's true or that even uh, something going twice as fast has four times the energy. It's just not true. It's not found in any experimental evidence. They can't collect this thing they're calling energy. And if you can't collect it, it's not energy. The very nature of energy is the fact that it does stuff. And if your energy doesn't do stuff, then it isn't energy. It isn't real. It's just a fable. So, in that light... Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the third law. So Newton um, stated a third law that, uh, that equal and opposite reaction is probably a better way to say it than actually being too technical because in some cases the opposite reaction isn't uh, overtly obvious. <laughs> so you could say like in the case of um, even just the simple pendulum experiment where you have uh, you know one object's moving the other one's not moving it hits this one gets the velocity this one stands still you know and it just goes back and forth and you know technically yeah this one doesn't have any opposite reaction and that it's not obviously opposite except that it stops okay so it goes from moving okay to stopping and so that would be called a counter force that stopped it. But I'd say the more accurate statement is, is that obviously the energy, okay, just transfers from one object to the other object, and then gravity does the reversal of the direction, clearly indicating that there's no such thing as positive and negative direction, because it's obviously going to move in both directions <laughs> um, freely, quite easily. Uh, without any loss of energy so it doesn't take it doesn't require you to sacrifice energy to change directions all you have to do is hit the right spring like gravity all right so um, so they've converted the third law into some notion that um, there's such a thing as uh, negative you know energy or direction that somehow there's a positive direction and a negative direction and the real point is is that there has to be conservation. So in any collision or any interaction between objects moving in the universe, the momentum has to be conserved. That would be a better statement of the third law. Is that you have to always conserve the total movement. So a certain amount of movement goes in, a certain amount of movement of mass has to come out. Movement times mass. Velocity times mass. Momentum. Um, all right, and so, but they've perverted that into some notion that there's a positive and a negative direction, and you know that in each one of these cases you do uh, somehow make extra energy. So we could have the example of two objects in space, okay, and we'll just say they're a hundred pounds each, and we're just going to throw a ball bearing. Let's say we're going to shoot a ball bearing that's going to bounce back and forth between the two objects. So we're just injected it with a momentum. You could have a little, you know, you could have had a little recess here with a spring and it shoots it out. Lots of ways to get in between the two objects. But it's now going to bounce between the two objects. So we have two objects sitting here in space. 
in a non-gravitational field, so you're in orbit or you're someplace where the gravity is balanced. And <clears throat> the simple argument can be made <laughs> is that basically their physics says, now this is what the implications of their physics is, is that when the ball bearing hits this object, okay, it's going to move it, okay. It's going to give it a velocity, a momentum, all right. And the momentum will be twice what it starts with. So let's say we gave it, we just start with 100. That makes things easy. So it's 100 momentums. Mass times velocity will be 100. We hit the object and we have now 200 momentum in this object and we get a perfect reflection of 100%. Because there's no atmosphere, there's nothing to stop the nearly perfect reaction. We have hardened steel surface, so very little losses. Uh, and... Um, then it's going to hit this other side and do exactly the same thing. It's going to give it two, 200 momentums, <laughs> okay, and it's going to move it, all right? And now it's going to go back and it's going to do it again. It's going to give this even more velocity. So now it's going to go up to 400 momentums. And then the ball is going to bounce back 100% the same speed, so it still has 100% of its momentum. It never loses any momentum, so it creates 400 over here. So it's going faster and faster because you keep hitting it and adding more mv to it. And you do it again, and now you have <laughs> yeah, now, now you have 600, right? You just keep adding 200. So this is their this is their theory. Now, you know, if they say it's not their theory, let's let a physicist say that's not what their theory says will happen. So you can see it can just go faster and faster and faster and faster and faster until it gets up to the speed of the ball bearing and the ball bearing can't catch up to it anymore. So there's going to be a point where this will really slow down because the distance will be large enough and the two objects will be moving fast enough that the ball bearing won't be able to keep bouncing back and forth. But it won't be until it's given quite a bit of velocity to both objects. So clearly that doesn't make any sense at all. All right, the other experiment that can, you know, seems pretty easy to do. I mean, this one, it's surprising that there's no example of it. You know, just nothing. All right, just have a spring on a wall, okay, and you just launch something, okay, any mass of any whatever, doesn't make any difference, um, and see what its velocity is. All right, uh, what, what's the momentum you get out of the spring for the object when it's attached to a non-movable surface. And then the question is, can I ever achieve a higher, you know, equal that velocity attaching it to some other object? And my simple argument is, of course, not. So the two experiments would be to have, you know, some lesser mass that's mobile, okay, and see what you get out of the spring. Because the idea is, is whatever does go this way has to steal from what would go this way. <laughs> That's the simple argument. So attaching it to a non-movable surface means you're going to get more velocity here, okay, and you're going to get less velocity here. You know, I guess I should have wrote that the other way, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and so this relates to the experiment where you put a spring between, you know, a two mass and a one mass. All right, and, um, you know, this gets one half the velocity, okay, that this gets, and it all seems to add up, okay, and everything starts going south very quickly as soon as you start changing these masses, all of a sudden you start getting more and more energy out of the same spring, and the simple argument is, is well, that would be a violation of Newton's third law, there can't be more energy in the spring, so something else has to explain that phenomenon, and... Uh, my simple explanation is uh, that um, the problem just lies with the velocity of the spring. The spring has a limitation to its maximum velocity. It has a maximum velocity. So if you put a certain object that's uh, you know light enough, it won't ever be able to give its full momentum to it because the spring velocity, okay, when the object leaves, Right, the object is going to leave at say 50 miles per hour. Okay, um, clearly the spring has to be going that speed for the object to go that speed. And when the object's going 50 and the spring's only going 49, you can understand that the spring now has nothing to push on. So the spring's just going to waste the rest of the energy. 
All right, so this 49 momentum of this this MV is still in there. Okay, the mass of the spring plus its velocity is still in the spring. And the fact is, is the slower the spring has to go when the object's leaving. So if I use a heavier mass and I push it away, it's going to be going a much lower velocity. So let's say it's 25 miles per hour. And so the spring only has 25, 24 miles per hour left in it. Okay, so it's obviously going much slower. So it's MV that it still has, okay, is one half the MV that it had. So clearly the heavier the object, the more efficient the spring will be in giving its energy. And the lighter the object, the less efficient the spring will be in giving back the energy. So springs are very good at collecting energy. So if you want to collect energy, there's no velocity problem. But giving it back, there is a velocity problem. The spring will retain an amount of energy you can sort of understand, like I said, if I put a very light object on the spring, a little piece of crumpled paper, that the spring won't be able to give the crumpled paper a faster velocity than it can move. So it's just going to basically, the spring will spring out, the paper will leave, the spring won't have anything to push on, and it'll still be going very fast, and it's just going to do this thing. It's going to wobble back and forth with a lot of energy it didn't release into the object. And the heavier the thing it's pushing, the slower it's going to be moving, and the less it's going to wobble after it's pushed. So you can understand that clearly that's an inefficiency in getting the energy out of the spring. And so, therefore, in this case where you're pushing against an immovable wall versus a movable object, that you definitely will get more velocity with the immovable wall because the spring won't be going both ways. It won't be expanding in both directions. It will only be able to expand in one direction and will expand in that one direction, you have to argue, more rapidly. So do they believe this won't happen? That if I have an immovable object, I'll get um, somehow, <laughs> yeah, somehow, I'll get the same velocity that I'll get if I put it against a movable object. And the more movable the other object is, obviously the less uh, energy is going to go in the opposite direction. So the only, they only do the, the simple one experiment. They don't do the more complicated experiments, the more um, the experiments with the weight changes, because the fact is the rules change. The fact is the spring becomes less and less efficient. Uh, in terms of giving energy to the lighter side and more efficient in giving energy to the heavier side. Yeah, so I think that's enough. I'll think about it. I think I've had some other argument to throw in, but that's the implications of their physics. That's all I'm, you know, the point is, is their physics says a lot of things that just aren't true. Their physics says an 8-pound bowling ball going 16 miles an hour has twice the energy of a 16-pound ball going 8 miles an hour. And no bowler can find it. Twice the energy is a significant amount of energy. And it just can't be found. Um, you know, and I could talk about ballistic pendulums, and I could talk about car crashes and different things that just demonstrate there's no sign of this 1 half mv squared being uh, anywhere near an accurate formula. I mean, even the rocket lifting off from the ground. The number of joules, okay, represented as the kinetic energy of the exhaust will not equal the momentum given to the spaceship. But the momentum of the exhaust will obey the third law and will push the spaceship. I mean, it's just such an obvious statement saying which one is real. Is momentum real or kinetic energy, as the formula states it, real? which one is truly conserved. And clearly, in the case of something as dramatic as rockets navigating space, uh, momentum rules entirely, completely, exclusively. And there's no sign of any credibility, any notion that there's any reason to square velocity and assume that higher velocity is more energy. It's not more energy. It's just energy you can deliver quicker and that's it. It has advantages, but the advantages aren't because it has more power, that it has more um, force. 
It's just that it applies the force in ways that can, you know, break the surface of a material, crack it, or just, you know, fracture it. Um, but it doesn't have any more actual capacity to move mass of velocity. It has the same capacity to move mass of velocity. One atom moving a thousand miles an hour has the same capacity to move mass of velocity. That is, if you uh, allow it to interact with a field of objects, it will not give those objects any more momentum than it has. And the same is true for the thousand atoms going one mile an hour. They can only make the same exact amount of momentum in other objects. They can't make less action than the, you know, the thing with a thousand times more energy. The one stated to have a thousand times more energy will not move a thousand times more mass a thousand times faster. All right. Will not move either a thousand times more mass or, okay, um, move mass a thousand times faster. It won't do that. Uh, okay, so leave us pause. All right, so I'll just clarify a little bit. So what I'm arguing is that they did an experiment where you have a movable object and an immovable object. All right. The the uh, the point is is that the the velocity going back this way, okay, will not be the same for. The object. So you put the same mass on this side. You have this side in one case can't move and the other case does move. And the ar argument is, is for every bit of movement you get in this object, you will get less movement in this object. And just a fact, okay, that they won't be the same uh, because, uh, yeah, you can see that. Yeah, it's this example here. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, so not a difficult experiment to do. So all these are not difficult experiments to do. Um, and um, yeah, they just haven't done them. Again, the simple experiment would just be to do the tug of war between the five mass going 10 velocity and the 10 mass going five velocity. So an experiment done all the time, just put a spring between them, you create that automatic result and then just tie a string between them. And when the string ends, will the object with twice as much kinetic energy demonstrate that it has twice the ability to do work? And the fact is, it won't. It'll be a tie. They'll both stop um, and jostle about and dissipate their energy without one of them showing that it has more energy than the other. Just a fact. And they won't show you that experiment because it completely annihilates any credibility to the notion that one half mv squared is an accurate description of reality. It's a fable. It's nonsense. It was never proven with evidence. It still hasn't been proven with evidence. And that's 300 years of shame because they've used it to do all kinds of other physics and make a mess frankly, distort the reality um, based on this fable. They've injected the fable into all elements of particle and uh, energy physics and ruined it, frankly. All right, so until the next time and such and so forth and whatnot, we'll call that enough of a video uh, and such.